last fall, Chief Justice John Roberts, he issued a very rare statement because the President of the United States was attacking judges. And the President doubled down afterwards. And he said, sorry, Chief Justice John Roberts, but you do indeed have Obama judges. And they have a much different point of view than people who are charged with the safety of our country. Do the attacks on those judges threaten the rule of law and everything that you just discussed about laws and about judges? Well, what I'd say to that, again, is the rule of law in this country is strong strong and stable, and we are very fortunate. We shouldn't forget how fortunate we are. We should take care with what we have. It's a great inheritance, and I'd say to anybody who questions uh, what a wonderful inheritance we have in our courts and the rule of law in this country, go spend six weeks in a court in another country of your choice, and come back and tell me what you think about our courts in and this what country. What would you say to somebody who attacks judges and also what does that do for the safety of judges it's very important i think and you're talking in this book about the separation of powers and people staying in their lanes but i think that these attacks are important but ruth bader ginsburg recently said they're age old but judges can't defend themselves well I'm, i think i'm doing a pretty good job of it right now with you in explaining i hope the role of law the role of judges in our country and why i think we have something very special that we forget at our risk Right? Um, is it easy to take for granted? Is it easy to forget what a gift we have? Of course it is, every day. I hear young people, for example, say, um, I'm a citizen of the world. I don't need to worry about these things. But you're uh, about, not touching on the attacks. You don't want to touch on that. Well, I, 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 I'm answering you as best I can, consistent with my judicial role, as I understand it, all right? And my answer to you is, when you, when you say, I don't care about judges or the Constitution or the role of law in this country, and I'm a citizen of the world or whatever, whatever answer you have. I, if you're telling me I, I, I care about the dignity, dignity of each person, I say, wonderful, I'm with you. If, you. if you're telling me you don't care about the Constitution, the separation of powers, the independence of the judiciary, then I say you're missing something very vital and a wonderful gift, an inheritance you've received. And, and you forget it at your risk. It's the announcement of your nomination. Two White House lawyers dressed in suits show up in your hometown, laid back hometown, and they have one task, which is to whisk you away, away from the media and bring you to Washington so nobody sees you. And they thought they came up with a great idea for your escape. What was it? Well, they're, they're, they're lovely young men. And you're right, they, they flew in uh, a couple nights before the nomination my small town in Colorado. And their idea was they were just gonna drive me to the airport and everything was gonna be fine. And we had them over for supper. They told me they were coming and Louise said, well, let's have them. And I just finished mowing the lawn and it was great. It was a calm Sunday evening. She makes curry on Sunday evenings. And then uh, the plan was Monday morning we were gonna go. Uh, but the president tweeted out that the announcement was gonna take place the next morning and so all of a sudden, some of your colleagues, reporters, descended on the uh, end of our street and blocked the entrance with all of their vans. And so the young men were very concerned that they would be seen if they drove in. And ultimately, the plan they hatched was to ask Louise and me to hike out from our home, about a mile, to a trailhead where they'd pick us up at the highway. And that, I confess, I'm, maybe it's a little judicial independence or Western spirit, but that was not something that either Louise or I was excited about. Her roller bag would not do great on those trails. So instead, we asked our next door neighbor, who was a dear friend, an old dear friend, and I'm sure he'll be watching this and very excited to hear about this, uh, if he wouldn't mind driving us out, because they, the, the reporters had seen his car come and go, and maybe they wouldn't notice if we were in the car, and if they did, that would be better than hiking. Um, and he said, of course, he'd be delighted to drive us after he took a shower. Um, I don't know why he had to take a shower. And he had a big SUV, and we got in the SUV, and he said, you know, Neil, there's another way out. And I lived there a long time, and there's only one road in and out of our, our home. And he said, no, 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 see that horse trail over there? That actually, you can drive that, I've done it. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, Neil, I grew up in Iran during the revolution and I would never buy a house with only one way out. So you we were going to take your wife's Roly <laughs> on a trail 
and meet them at a trailhead. Well, that was, that was, that was a possible plan, yes. Um, we, we call that our escape from Lookout Ridge. Turning to the confirmation process, which you write about in this book, <clears throat> here's what you said. By the end of it all, I came to realize that some today perceive a judge to be just like a politician who can and must promise and then deliver policy outcomes that favor certain groups. Have you felt that kind of pressure as a judge? Uh, not as a judge, but during the confirmation process. I mean, really the reason why I wrote the book is because I did see during the confirmation process, I felt like some people thought that way about judges, that they are just politicians with robes. And that's just so radically inconsistent with my lived experience as a lawyer and as a judge, where men and women of our judiciary work hard every day uh, to try and answer the cases before them as fairly as they can, without respect to persons, as our judicial oath says. And so I wanted to talk about my experience and how different it is from how it's often portrayed. That's why uh, you wrote the book. Yeah. But when you went through that process, do you think it's irretrievably broken? Oh, gosh, Arianne, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in the confirmation process politics. There's nothing more political in, in the world today than that, perhaps. I can say this, that our federal judiciary is stocked with men and women who have given up a tremendous amount to serve because they love this country, because they believe the Constitution is the greatest charter of human liberty the history's ever known. And they, they do it faithfully every day. And they do it mostly anonymously, not with bright lights and, and, and reporters, but, maybe um, but the quietly. Process, maybe the process doesn't serve them. That's why I asked. I mean, you wrote a lot about that process. And, and your own process was rancorous at times. The Democrats were furious that uh, President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, didn't get uh, a hearing. <clears throat> and one of your first calls was to Merrick Garland. Why did you call him and what did you say? Well, I, I, I respect Merrick Garland greatly and always have for a very long time. Um, we're very blessed in our federal judiciary to have men and women, outstanding public servants, who've given up lucrative private practice to serve this country. And they do it mostly quietly, mostly anonymously, because they love the Constitution. They love the United States of America. Um, and in a lot of ways, this book's about them. Many of them could have written the same book and said much what I have to say in this book about the separation of powers, about why I believe originalism is a faithful interpretation of our Constitution, as well as some of the challenges we face in terms of delivering access to justice in this country, all of which are matters I touch on and I know that are near and dear to the hearts of so many judges in this country. And I want to get to that, and I'm going to get to that, but just lastly on the uh, the confirmation process. Because a politically charged confirmation process is going to impact the courts. And it's going to make the, maybe some people think the courts are political. Do you think it'll make people lose faith in the courts or at the very least yeah. say, well, why do we have to abide by those decisions? Well, here's what I'd love to say about that. That sometimes we lose sight of the forest for the trees. And it's easy to do in our daily lives. And maybe it's easy enough to do when we're reading headlines. But the rule of law in this country is one of the wonders of the world. Step back and look at the forest, all right? Um, I, I like to talk about some facts, some figures that I think really explain how I see the forest. And I think most federal judges do too. There are about 50 million lawsuits filed in this country every year. We're a litigious bunch. Right. Now that doesn't count your traffic tickets. That doesn't count your parking tickets. That's like another 50 million, all right? Now out of those 50 million in the federal courts, I'm more familiar with them, the numbers, about 95% are resolved by trial judges without an appeal. Now I was a lawyer and I had some losing causes. Every lawyer who's worth his salt has had a few. Yeah. Your client's not happy but they accept the judgment of the jury or the judge as reasonably fair. And that's the That's key. incredible. I'm not, I'm just getting started, okay? But that's what I'm trying to get I, and at. I, and it's, I am too. Let's look at the forest. Are you worried about that? No, I, I believe, I'm, I am hugely optimistic about it, okay? And here's why, I, I, the figures tell you why. So 95% resolved in the trial court. Now I served on a court of appeals where they hear the 5% that, that, that come upstairs to the court of appeals. And I served on a court 
that covered 20% of the continental United States, two time zones, with judges appointed by President Obama all the way back to President Lyndon Baines Johnson. One of my colleagues was appointed the year before I was born. We sit in panels of three. Can't do anything unless you have three of us around. Now, we'd agree on the outcome of those 5% of the hard cases, unanimously, the three of us, 95% of the time. That's incredible. And then, all right, the Supreme Court. You want to talk about this court, this beautiful place where I'm blessed to work. We hear 70 cases a year. Right. That is it out of that 50 million. It's incredible. The stability of our law, the predictability of our law, the uniformity of our law is a wonder of the world, and it's an envy of the world. And fine, let's talk about those 70 cases. Those are the really hard ones where the lower court judges have disagreed. That's, right. that's why we take those cases. Right. Right? And there are nine of us appointed by presidents, five different presidents, over 30 years, nearly 30 years, from all across the country. Very different, independent, wonderful people and great colleagues, by the way. And we managed to come to yes, unanimously, about 40% of the time. Now try and get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch. All right? But, but that that happens, but that is the answer. That is the forest. Do we have our problems? Of course we do. Of course we do. And you're not helped by the confirmation process that makes things look political. You, those are your words. Okay. All right. My, 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 my words are, we are enormously blessed and lucky and we sometimes overlook the forest for the tree. Um, changing gears, the country and the media, they often focus on those five, four uh, opinions that break down along ideological lines. But you have sided with the liberals on the bench when it comes to the rights of criminal defendants. You write about it in your book. Are the folks who pushed for your confirmation, are they in for a surprise in this area of the law that you care about? Well, if anybody thinks uh, it's a surprising thing that a judge will follow his or her conscience and his, his or her best understanding of the Constitution, then I suppose they might be surprised. But I don't think anybody is terribly surprised when a judge does those things in this country. That's what judges are supposed to do. The separation of powers, I think, is vitally important, and I do want to talk about that. Everybody knows their First Amendment rights, right. or at least some of them, yeah. and, and they also understand the connection between the Bill of Rights and their liberty. Yeah. But the separation of powers, Madison knew, was really what keeps us free, right? A Bill of Rights is just a set of promises on paper. Right. What makes a promise worth the words on the paper are the enforcement mechanisms behind it. Right. Madison knew this. He didn't even want to bother with the Bill of Rights. He says, if we get the structure right, if we get the separation of powers right, all that will follow. And I think the proof in our day is this. I look around the world and I think, our Bill of Rights is excellent, but if I had to pick one, I might pick North Korea's. Right. North Korea has that an excellent book. Bill of Rights. And you think that everybody, that's easy to do, but what's more important is the structure of government. Well, exactly, because look at, North, look, look at North Korea. They promise all the rights we have, right. and a bunch more. Right to free medical care, right to free education, and my favorite, a right to relaxation. Now ask political prisoners how, how's that working out. The fact of the matter is those promises aren't worth the paper they're written on right. because there aren't structures to keep the power from flowing into one set of hands. Absolutely. That's the key. But what happens when politicians become judges? Right. Right. When elected persons become judges, do you really want your rights under law to be adjudicated by a bureaucrat who's appointed by a president and responsive to a president? Right. Do you want a king for four years deciding your cases and controversies? No, you want a jury and an independent judge. Do you want judges rewriting the law, which is what happens with vague statutes? Do you want judges to become politicians? Well, judges would make rotten politicians, all right? And you wouldn't want them to do that. Who would want nine people writing new laws for a country of 330 million Americans across a continent? Right. That'd be crazy. So the separation of powers is what keeps us free. And the problem is though, and Madison knew this too, and so did Jefferson, that the constitution of the separation of powers is only as good as the people who want it. And you know, Jefferson said that if you expect an ignorant people to remain free, you want something that has never happened in history 
and will never happen. And so I think we need to appreciate the link between the separation of powers and our freedom. So you write a lot. You say judges don't wear capes. But what about people who see the court as the backstop to ensure rights and liberties? What about those people? Well, it, it absolutely is a backstop to ensure your rights and liberty. That is our job. It isn't to pick favorites, though. There's a reason why Lady Justice is portrayed with a blindfold, right? We're supposed to take each person equally as he or she comes to us and adjudicate their rights under law the same, without respect to persons. That is our job. Now, is it our job to make stuff up? Do you want me to make stuff up? I don't think so. I have said that judges wear robes, not capes, for that reason, to try and make that point uh, to young persons sometimes. You know, we wear po black polyester robes, nothing fancy. And our job is just to make sure the law that you, that we, the people, have enacted through our Constitution or through our democratic processes, everyone gets the benefit of that law. That's what a neutral judge is for. Let me switch gears a little bit because we were talking about the independence of the judiciary. And I want to go back to the president because he praised you during 2017 at a campaign rally. And he said something like, Neil Gorsuch, he'll save people's Second Amendment rights. But do comments like that, does that blur for the public? Does it blur the lines between politics and the law? I'm not going to get involved in politics or political campaign rallies. That's not my business. My business is to make sure that your rights, all of them, are enforced. You uh, look to the original public meaning of the Constitution. Some people think that that's outdated. Some people think it's the horse and buggy days. And one of your colleagues recently, she gave a talk at the Clinton Center, and she said, think about how things were in 1787. Who were we the people? Certainly not people who were held in human bondage because the original Constitution preserves slavery and certainly not women. What would you say to your colleague about her pushback on your judicial philosophy of originalism? Well, the only thing I'm going to say to Ruth is I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing her on the first Monday in October. She's strong and she's a wonderful colleague. But as to originalism, what I would say is the original Constitution now includes 27 amendments passed by we the people. Not nine judges sitting in Washington, but we the people amended the Constitution to fix both of those grave injustices the injustice of slavery and the injustice of the treatment of women in this country and their, and their suffrage. We the people through the amendment process prescribed by the Constitution, the original Constitution, improved the Constitution, made it a better document. And that is the proper process to do that. For an originalist, that's the right way to do things. So how I came to originalism is by looking at how it affected real people in real lives as a judge, as a lawyer, and what does originalism say? Originalism says simply that the words on the page that were written and ratified by the people cannot be changed except for by the processes the people have prescribed. I can't change them. A court can't change them. You can change them through amendments if you want. And there have been 27 of them in our history. But your critics would say that I'm just, takes time. I, I, I'm just getting started, OK? I mean, I, you asked me a big question. Let, let, me, let me provide a, a reasonable answer, all right? Uh, so originalism just says those words on the page, they're yours. And that your judges shouldn't add to them, and they shouldn't take them away. Is that horse and buggy? I don't think so. So a few examples of how originalism is applied to today's world, right? How, how it actually affects real people in real life. Take the Fourth Amendment. It says no unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, is it a search for the government to have a helicopter and hover above your house and peer down? Well, of course James Madison didn't know about, horse, uh, about helicopters, but he did know about the area around your house, the curtilage. And if you sneak in and look at it, that's a search. Well, non-originalist judges, this court, has said that's not a search. Let's shift gears, collegiality on the court. Um, the court is working hard to send a message that you can get along. Uh, you can disagree civilly. You talk about the rituals the court goes through. You talk about uh, Justice Breyer, who says endless reserves of knock-knock jokes. They're, they work to disagree in an agreeable way. That's what the court's trying to do, isn't it, in these times? Well, I think at all times, and all courts do. 
and I think this court does a, a remarkably good job of it, right? You give us the 70 hardest cases a year, you put nine people in a room together and ask them to make decisions. It's hard to get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch, right? But we managed to reach unanimous decisions in about 40% of our cases, as, as we discussed. I think that's an incredible testament to collegiality, to hard work, to friendship. That doesn't happen magically or overnight. And yes, we have a lot of fun together along the way, too. In, in one area, though, there have been some public disagreements, particularly last year, and that's in the death penalty. The death penalty is different, right? It has um, brought up bitter public divides. Is it, uh, is it because the death penalty is different? Is it because Justice Kennedy's no longer on the court? Why have there been, has there been a lot of rancor in those cases? Well, there's, there's disagreement in a lot of our cases because there are some hard issues. Um, there's no question about that. Um, but there's a lot of reservoir of goodwill and friendship on this court. And just because we disagree, it doesn't mean we're disagreeable with one another. Never. Um, but though it's been tough, the death penalty at times. A lot of a cases. 3 a.m. opinion, oh you wrote a contentious death penalty opinion. It's tough, that there one. There are a lot of cases that are tough, of course. Um, that's why they wind up in this court. Um, but again, I wouldn't miss the forest for the trees here. Um, I think it's remarkable that we managed to find unanimous agreement where lower courts have disagreed so often. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has now announced her fourth bout of cancer. How have the justices responded to the notorious RBG? Well, I mean, we all adore Ruth Bader Ginsburg and wish her nothing but the best and look forward to seeing her on the bench very soon. Um, I can tell you she provided a very warm welcome for me when I arrived here. A long time ago, I had been a law clerk to Byron White, the first justice from Colorado. And when he retired, I was his law clerk. And one of the things the justice was doing when I arrived was gathering together his law clerk manual, which was a bit, of, bit messy and trying to put it in neat form to provide it to his successor, who was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we provided that to her. And he wrote something typically humble, like, I don't know if this will be any help, but in case you find it useful, here's, here are my notes for my law clerks that I give them every year. Well, fast forward about 25 years, whatever it was, my first week on the court, what do I receive? The note in my inbox, along with a big binder, saying, you may recognize some of this. I hope I've improved it a little bit since you've last seen it. Cameras in the courtroom. You left open the possibility of cameras in the courtroom. Any chance you're persuading your colleagues to allow them? You know, I'm still relatively new here, and I wouldn't presume to tell some of my colleagues who've been here for a great deal longer um, how to think on this question, and I'm still, still thinking about it myself. Because it sure would be a way for the public to understand what the courts do. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. One big uh, theme last term, and you write about it in your book, is when should justices overturn precedent? Justice uh, Breyer, Justice Kagan, uh, they were bothered last term. They felt like the court was doing it too quickly. You write about the pros and the cons. In layman's terms, when should a judge consider overturning a past Supreme Court case? On the one hand, it would be wrong to say never. And on the other hand, it'd be wrong to say always, right? You'd let, be left with serious injustices on the books, Plessy versus Ferguson, Korematsu, Dred Scott, if, if, if you respected precedent always. And if you never respected precedent, you'd be ignoring the wisdom of people who've come before you and thought hard about this question. So you need some humility in the process. So you have to weigh a number of different factors. And we have a whole jurisprudence on this. And in the book, I talk about this and try and explain it in kind of plain terms that people can understand. But a judge has to consider among other things, how well reasoned the opinion was, how carefully it was done, how long it's been on the books. Are there reliance interests that have formed around it or not? Um, those are some of the factors. Let me ask you, your old boss, Byron White, he said every time a new member comes on the court, the whole court changes. How did the court uh, change with Justice Brett Kavanaugh? Well, I've known Justice Kavanaugh for 40 years. And he's a good friend. and It was delightful to have him come on the court. Uh, he's been a great addition. We had, we had a little bit of fun when he arrived, too. Um, so uh, one tradition of the court is that the junior justice has to arrange the welcome dinner for the new incoming junior justice. Justice Kagan did a marvelous job 
with mine. She, she knew that Louise loves Indian food, and she had an, a chef come in and provide this incredible, lavish Indian dinner for us. It was magnificent. But I, I've known Justice Kavanaugh, as I say, a long time, and I knew he, he's kind of a meat and potatoes kind of guy, so dinner was going to be a little boring, and I had to do something on the entertainment front to make things more interesting. And um, I wasn't sure how it was going to go over, to be honest with you. But the, the Washington Nationals, he's a big fan of the baseball team. And their mascots are these, they call them the, the presidents, and they race around, and, and they have giant foam heads. And, and so I, I didn't tell anybody, because I f figured it might be better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And, and, and we had a couple of them in the Great Hall, and we had a race. A race between the mascots. We did. And he enjoyed that. I think so. What, what is the most important area where the two of you disagree in the law? Oh, gosh, I expect we're going to disagree on lots of things over time. Judges aren't robots. Um, we all come, come at it with our own perspectives, and we each study it independently. You, you, um, that's one of the wonderful things about a judge. No pressure to decide your case because of politics. The only incentive is to try hard to get it right as best you can. And I expect sometimes he's going to see it one way and I another. Some people would think two of President Trump's uh, nominees would see the law exactly the same way. These are hard cases. These are incredibly hard cases. Of course, good judges, good faith, are going to sometimes disagree on them. Another question. Democrats are think, or have said, have floated the possibility that there should be more Supreme Court justices. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg doesn't think that's a good idea. What do you think about adding more justices? Oh, now we're going back to politics, and I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to just reiterate, though, that I think this court works incredibly well together. It's a wonderful group of colleagues. You're no longer the junior most justice. That came with a few tasks. Can you talk a little bit about what you had to put up with with the junior most justice? Well, I, I love being the junior justice. Um, you're the last to speak when the discussion goes around the table. So by that point, you've had the learning of all of your colleagues to consider. And sometimes everybody is hanging on your last word. And sometimes, by, in some cases, they don't care what you're going to say because the, uh, the case is a foregone conclusion. Uh, so it's, it was fun to be junior justice, too. Um, uh, maybe the m most unusual duty is the cafeteria duty, um, where we represent our colleagues on the cafeteria committee. Now, I didn't have any great changes to the cafeteria committee. Justice Kagan did. She included a new yogurt machine that's very popular. But I did get a note at, toward the end of my tenure from Joanna Breyer, Mrs. Breyer, and it meant a lot to me. Her husband, of course, was a junior justice for, I think, 11 years, incredibly long time. But she wrote me a note saying that she had just had the best meal she ever had in the cafeteria, and whatever I was doing was working. So, but you didn't do anything. She didn't write that to her husband. Well, I didn't. You didn't do, really do I anything. I didn't do anything. Well, yeah. don't tell anybody that. Uh, let me ask you this: Next term is going to be a blockbuster term. LGBT rights, Second Amendment, immigration. There are many people who are thrilled that you're on the court, but there are a lot of people who are concerned. They're concerned about the direction of the court. What can you tell them, and what can the court do to build public confidence? Well, I think all a judge can do is fulfill his or her oath as best they can. And that means deciding each case as carefully as they can with attention to the briefs and the arguments listening to their colleagues, and as independently as they can muster, putting all the other stuff aside, right? Politics, your personal points of view, you leave that over there. When you put on the robe, you put that stuff aside, and you open your mind, and you listen. And that's all a judge can ever promise. Can't promise outcomes. Can only promise their best efforts in the process. So to the people who say, this court is going to move. They're going to overturn precedent. And now they're uh, five solid members. We could see a hard right turn. Again, I, I think each judge, I, I just don't view judges that way. I, I reject that idea of how judges operate. As we talked about earlier, about half, 40% of our cases are decided unanimously. Um, you talked about the five, four cases. They make up a quarter of our docket, maybe a third. Those numbers have been consistent since the Second World War. The only thing that's new is that nothing is new. 
Not much has changed. The world continues very much as it has since the Second World War. And that among those five, four cases, again, you know, this last term, there were 10 different combinations of them. You have nine very independent people approaching these cases as best they can. Last question. Some people do think things have changed. Uh, when you say nothing has changed, now there are solid five conservative members on the court. Something has changed. Yeah, I just, I, again, you, 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 to, to my mind, it hasn't. The, the, the wonder of the rule of law in this country is its consistency over time and how people can order their affairs and their lives around our Constitution, our laws, with incredible accuracy compared to so many other places in the world. And as troublesome as sometimes our times may seem, and as difficult as they may appear to us, this country has been through a lot of challenges and always risen resiliently to them, whether it's the civil rights movement, surviving through our civil war, or today's challenges. Whatever they may be, I've got great confidence in America. And I say to those who don't, look elsewhere. Where else would you rather be?